I'd like to um, uh, introduce this morning's moderator, David Steiner. He is a former Bostonian. We'd like to get him back someday. Uh, he is the Clara and Larry Silverstein Dean at the Hunter College School of Education and founding director of the CUNY Institute for Education Policy, which will launch in spring 2013, a much needed uh, activity in New York where there isn't a, a steady voice on education policy yet. Uh, previously, he served as Commissioner of Education in the state of New York, as Director of Education at the National Endowment for the Arts, and as Chair of the Department of Education Policy here at Boston University, where he authored Defining Research on the Deficiencies of Teacher Preparation Programs in the United States. Again, another worthy topic. Uh, David consults broadly and has authored or edited books, book chapters, and more than 50 articles on education issues. He was educated at Balliol College, Oxford, where he earned BA and MA degrees in Harvard University, from which he holds a doctoral degree in political science. David, thank you very much for being here this morning. Maybe the panel would like to join as a stage. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be back here. I miss Boston terribly, uh, not only because of the years in Albany, um, but because uh, I have very, very good friends here and fond memories of working with John Silber uh, in the early days of the MCAS and the reforms that Sandy has been so seminal in uh, making real. Let me say a few words about the panel members. We have one person who is still to join us, but. Um, starting on my immediate right is a very old friend, Mark Bauerlein, uh, professor of English at Emory University. Um, Mark has a huge list of publications. Two of them uh, are behind you. Um, he started with serious stuff, uh, Waltman and the American Idiom, The Pragmatic Mind, Literary Criticism and Autopsy, um, and has bent his enormous talents to our current cultural crises uh, with works on the digital divide, on uh, Facebook, on other matters of the younger generation uh, with his acerbic wit uh, and high intelligence on full view. I very deeply recommend those works to you if you don't know them already. Um, Sandy Stotsky probably needs very little introduction to most of you in the room. She's currently Professor of Education Reform at the University of Arkansas and the 21st Century Chair in Teacher Quality. Latest book is The Death and Resurrection of a Coherent Literature Curriculum, a very optimistic title from Sandy. Um, and uh, before that, of course, famously served as the Senior Associate Commissioner on the Massachusetts Department of Education um, and Massachusetts Board of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, from 2006 to 2010. Um, another uh, colleague from the past, I had the privilege of serving on the Core Knowledge Board for some time, uh, Robert Pondiscio is the Vice President and Director of Communications at the Core Knowledge Foundation. Um, prior to joining the foundation, he served and taught uh, fifth grade in the South Bronx, and my hat just goes off to him, uh, having spent a lot of time in those schools. That's the real thing. Um, he has brought a trench-like experience to one of the most important endeavors in education reform in the United States. Core Knowledge has recently been awarded um, one of the New York State RFPs to create a curriculum for the early grades, the crucial grades in reading. Uh, I was delighted by that award that took place after I, I was commissioner, uh, and I look forward to great things uh, from that introduction. I believe uh, Jeff Howard may join us uh, shortly. Uh, is he in the room yet? No, nope. okay. Um, maybe I'll introduce him should he join us. Uh, but for now, let's move right into our questions and, and our debate uh, about common core knowledge. And I'm going to begin by posing a single question to all three of you uh, for your reactions. David Coleman, the major architect of the standards in English language arts, said on several occasions and on camera that the crucial skills of reading are those, and I'm quoting, of the detective and the journalist, close quote. 
your reactions to that as a vision of reading. Uh, why don't we start with you, Mark? I, I, I suppose he means by that, by the journalist, you are collecting evidence and assembling it from different sources, different texts, in order to present, uh, well, I guess not an opinion as, as a journalist, but to offer the information accurately and to represent it to an audience effectively. By the detective, I, I presume we would get into the interpretative element where we look at objects in the world and we understand them as clues and we divine a meaning. We come up with a, a summation of what the big story is, what the subtext is, what, what the clues signify. And I think that, that's, uh, that, that, that that is, I suppose, a distinction that goes along with the informational text and the literary text. That while the literary text offers information, it can contain within it uh, ideologies, values, political positions, social, psychological content, that it really is an interpretative activity. We're coming up with what, what this literary text means, and we're offering you know, a, a perspective upon it. The informational text is more a question of summarizing, collecting, and reassembling the information in that text, again, in, a, in an effective fashion. So I presume that's what those metaphors or strategies uh, were designed to summarize, and I think it's a clever uh, approach to it. Um, if we start to look at it closely, uh, I think there's a nice, every nice, nice metaphor begins to break down when we get down to the specifics, the details, what are we gonna, how, how do we apply this to a text like Gulliver's Travels, for instance, um, complex literary texts. Maybe I should stop there and let, let, let the uh, move on, but just, I hope my summary is, is, is accurate. Sadie? I would say, <clears throat> pardon my voice, I would say that that kind of an approach to reading leaves out almost totally the literary reader. That would be, for me, the serious deficiency and basic omission. It leaves out almost all of the kind of reading I did for the first 20 years of my life and why I read. One read literature, and we can use Mark Twain as an example, to enter into an imaginary world created by an author. And if you read as a detective and as a journalist, then you do not enter into an imaginary world. You reduce, eliminate that imaginary world. So you have lost the value and the power of literature, which apparently was not even considered in the mix here to begin with. Before I was uh, in education, I had a previous career in um, the magazine world. Uh, I worked for Time Magazine and Business Week. And um, I'm listening to this, and I'm having a flashback to something that I thought was quite profound. And I'm only realizing now how much it's influenced me, that, that one of my editors there, Jim Gaines, who ran Time Magazine, said when he took over the magazine, this is back 20 years ago, uh, he said, and those of you who are news consumers will appreciate the sentiment, um, he said, don't tell, he was saying this to his, to his writers uh, at time, don't tell me what you think, tell me what you can find out. And I thought, well, that's brilliant, because that's really the soul of journalism, and we've gone too far in terms of um, you know, what we call the time tape journalism, columnists are sort of pulling on their chin and, and not reporting, but just giving you their, you know, copying an attitude, giving you their take. Um, I detect a similar spirit uh, in the Common Core, you know, and, and David Coleman, uh, who is a friend of mine and I admire, uh, had that inelegant turn of phrase, and you're all smiling because you know it's going to come out of my mouth, and I'm not going to say it, um, where he said, you know, you, get, you go on and you realize that nobody gives uh, you know, about what you think. Um, well, that's not how I would have said it. Uh, but as a teacher, I admire the sentiment uh, because the way I was taught to teach literacy to my students, um, you know, Ron Powers invoked uh, Lash's book, the, the, the Culture of Narcissism. But we have a curriculum of narcissism, narcissism now. 
where it is all uh, make a text to self connection, to use the, the, the term of art. Uh, nobody focuses on what they can find out in it. Now, does that mean that we should abandon one for the other? We're very prone to do this in education, to, to swing wildly from one extreme to the other. Of course not. Uh, but in that idea of being a detective, I think there's some real wisdom. And I, I think we, we, we ignore it at our peril. Thank you. I want now, having placed, as it were, the, the core sentiment of David Coleman uh, in the room, um, I, I'd like to invite each of the panelists to give us, uh, and I'll be a little bit strict here, just a couple of minutes um, on their own vision of the place of Common Core in either advancing or uh, retarding our movement towards a more educated America. And maybe, Sandy, I could start this time with you. Let me begin by noting what happened in Massachusetts itself, since some of you are connected with the educational scene here. And I looked at our guiding principles that had been in the English language arts curriculum framework 10 years ago, the ones that were abandoned in July 2010, and looked at the new ones that had been rewritten for Common Core. I had assumed that they would be adopted as a whole. I had been told that the people who were on a committee to adopt this extra 15% wanted to readopt what had framed this very successful document that had had apparently a very favorable impact on teachers, classrooms, and kids. The first principle that was about the same was about our literary heritage. Students need to become familiar with works that are part of a tradition going back thousands of years. Students should read literature reflecting the literary and civic heritage of the English speaking world. Then I looked at what was a new principle, and here is this new kid on the block reflecting the detective and the journalist, only it doesn't say so. Guiding principle three, an effective English language arts and literacy curriculum, this is new, draws on informational texts and multimedia in order to build academic vocabulary and strong content knowledge. Well, we've made a little pass for the value of literature, but this is the real thing, guys. I mean, this is what we're really all about. In all of their classes, I'm quoting now, including history, social science, science, technology, engineering, arts, comprehensive health, foreign language, and vocational and technical subjects, students should encounter many examples of informational and media texts aligned to the greater course curriculum. This kind of reading, listening, and viewing is the key to building a rich academic vocabulary and increasing knowledge about the world. Literature was okay for its time and place, but this is the real stuff. Well, of course, and I have maybe, what, 20 seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing that I know of as an academic researcher or as someone who has been involved in curriculum development one way or the other for most of my professional life to support this statement. That to me is the basic problem that what we have is a new credo that is being given to the educational field to support one person's vision. Why? We still really don't know exactly. But this one person in the entire country was given the opportunity to determine our English language arts standards for the country and imposed his particular vision on all the rest of us. And that's where it's at. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> Robert? I'm going to stand up in a few slides. Um, 
those who know me will tell you I'm a fairly mild-mannered guy. Um, in the rough and tumble of education reform arguments, I don't call people names, I don't yell, I don't scream, I don't grandstand. I have an instinct towards the middle. Um, but I am very clear on why I'm on this panel today, uh, because I'm the guy who likes common core state standards. Um, and they are, of course, as you just heard, the death knell of literature. Uh, so if, if this were a professional wrestling match, I would be the heavy. Uh, my role is to break a chair uh, over uh, the hero's head and sneer at you all. Uh, but please know, in the end, uh, good will out. Uh, Professor Bauerlein will pin me to the mat. Um, <laughs> Professor Stotsky will leap from the top rope, throw a somersault aerial uh, um, <laughs> leg drop on me. And if I don't tap out, then Jim Sturgios will come up and, and count to 10 and, and, and we'll be done. Um, Okay. Look, these are serious people and, and important scholars, and I'm an enormous admirer of, of each and every one, but if I'm going to play the heavy, I'm, I'm going to play my role correctly. So I want to show you what I consider to be the most important piece of data in American education. Uh, this is the National Assessment of Educational Progress in Reading for 17-year-olds in the U.S., the de facto final report card, if you like, on American education. Um, educational progress, what progress? 40 years, no progress. I can't look at NAEP scores without seeing a different chart. That one. Now, that, that, wait, that's not a chart, that's an EKG. Um, it's an EKG of somebody who's gone into cardiac arrest. Flatline, just like 12th grade NAEP. When the heart stops beating, several unpleasant things happen. The blood flow to the brain causes loss of consciousness. Left untreated for even five minutes, brain death starts to occur unless there is immediate and decisive treatment. Uh, American education, I will argue, has been suffering from a lack of oxygen to our collective brain, not just for five minutes, for five decades, longer. Brain damage is setting in. Call a code blue. Who's got the shock panels? Oh, that guy. But wait, that's not House, that's not Ben Casey, that's not Dr. McDreamy, that's David Coleman. <laughs> And if you look, he actually kind of looks like a TV doctor, doesn't he? I mean, you can almost imagine him saying, ask your doctor if common core state standards is right for you. <clears throat> he is, of course, the primary author of, of the ELA standards in English language arts, or as I like to think of them, the shock paddles. The reason I see common core as the defibrillator, our last chance to shock American education back to life boils down to 57 words, these 57 words. Uh, which I will read for you. By reading texts in history, social studies, science, and other disciplines, students build a foundation of knowledge in these fields that will also give them the background to be better readers in all content areas. Students can only gain this foundation when the curric curriculum is intentionally and coherently structured to develop rich content knowledge within and across grades. Now, you all know E.D. Hirsch, who's been a guest of these, these panels several times uh, before here, Pioneer. If you were to summarize his entire life's work in 57 words, that would be pretty good. Um, in fact, I will go as far as saying those 57 words are the most 57, most important 57 words we've had in ed reform since a nation at risk. Now, if time permitted, I would explain to you how broad general knowledge is indispensable to vocabulary growth and reading comprehension. Uh, if time permitted, I would also describe to you the tedious content-free reading instruction that I inflicted, me personally, for years on my fifth graders at PS277 in the South Bronx. How the best practices I served up to Vi Viviana Merchan, to Rebecca Daly, to Gabri uh, Gabriel Olivo, and Roberto Rivera was, I now understand, fundamentally flawed. How I denied those children what they really need to become proficient in English. Oh, wait a minute. Did I say need? Sorry. Needed. Past tense, it's over. Viviana dropped out of school in ninth grade. Uh, Roberto's in jail, so is Gabriel. Um, Rebecca has two children. Your tax dollars support them all. Hawk Finn, <coughs> forgive me, are you serious? You expect my former students to make sense of Hawk Finn with no foundational knowledge of 19th century America, of slavery, of riverboats, of rivers, they don't know where the Mississippi River is. They don't know whether it flows north or south. They don't know which direction is north or south. They left my classroom, my, my elementary school, without the most rudimentary knowledge they needed to make sense of the most basic text. But no common core? Illegal, you say. They de-emphasize literature, and besides, your own Massachusetts standards are superior, coercive, etc. Well, that's probably true. In fact, I'm sure it, it, it is, is true. Last thing I'll show you, in an unpublished, yet unpublished op-ed piece, uh, my colleague E.D. Hirsch writes the following. He says, it's not overstating the case 
to say that the most secure way to predict whether an educational policy is likely to help restore the middle class is to focus laser-like on the question, is this school policy likely to eventuate in a large increase in the vocabulary size of 12th graders? Well, implemented not just by the letter, but in its spirit, Common Core, by building knowledge, will increase vocabulary and language proficiency. Thank you. Mark? OK, uh, let, let me just um, point to a couple of, a couple of things uh, that are in that. I just did a little page of handouts uh, for you that I think Jamie circulated. Uh, Common Core uh, does contain some standard reading standards, uh, a couple of reading literature standards uh, that I re reproduced there that actually uh, maintain high expectations for literary reading in the, in the 11th and 12th, well, 9th and 10th, 11th grade, 12th grade classroom. You just have the phrase, drawing on a wide reading of world literature. Uh, include at least one play by Shakespeare and one play by, play by an American dramatist. The, this is a big one, the third one listed there. Demonstrate knowledge of 18th, 19th, and early 20th century foundational works of American literature, including how two or more texts. Uh, the, the informational standards uh, also talk about seminal US documents of historical and literary significance. Uh, you have a note on range of content and uh, note on ranging content of student reading that you can see there. Uh, Sandy actually uh, uh, worked on some of those standards. I, I worked on the, the note on the range of content originally in, in the document. And it does ask seminal US documents, the classics of American literature. And elsewhere in the document, they talk about mandated content. They use the term mandated here. And so actually uh, uh, the there are elements in the document that ask for precisely the literary historical knowledge that Robert mentioned as crucial for the comprehension, the background knowledge and, and that Hirsch has been talking about for many years. The problem is that these standards are overwhelmed by the informational reading uh, that Common Core is pressing and that you don't have enough machinery within the document to ensure that these standards are observed. I mean, I've talked to some people about these standards and they say, well, they're, they're just going to be ignored. They just won't pay any attention to them. And so this is where we, where we come down in our report uh, issued, uh, the, the one you have, is to say that this is where states have to come in. And Common Core asks states to come in, specify, add more standards of their own, and that there is room for them to ensure that these literary standards are, are observed. Now, the next part is the ACT traits of complex texts. Uh, ACT, in their research on reading and college readiness, determined that the clearest differentiator of college readiness and unreadiness is the ability to handle complex texts. Uh, it's a report, we, we, we cite the report in our, in our study, Common Core cites this report as well. So a student falters in that first year of college because the complex text is too much <coughs> for that student. It just They don't have the experience with it. And what are the traits of complex text? It's actually a fairly technical term in ACT's studies. And there you have the bullet points listed here. What are the traits of complex text? One, it, relationships. Interactions among ideas or characters in the text are subtle. So there, there you have uh, literature represented. Richness talks about literary devices. Uh, the text is organized in ways that are elaborate and sometimes unconventional. Well, where do you find unconventional structures in, in you know, modernist poems, uh, for instance? The author's tone and use of language are often intricate. Anyway, I, I won't belabor the point, but just to say that the general issue is that literariness is a heavy feature of complex texts. Not, 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 not exhaustive, certainly. But you can have forms of density and vocabulary that are not literary. But according to ACT and Common Core citation of it, literariness is an essential, not, not an essential, a, a, a prominent element of complex text. And the reading of literature helps students at the college readiness level in, in the first year. And Common Core's big thing is to promote college readiness. This means that we need to maintain or even increase, given the flat line, 
uh, since the early 70s on NAEP reading scores for 12th graders. And college readiness in ACT and reading has always it's been 52% for the last few years. And so that suggests we need to maintain and actually raise the reading level of literary texts in the English classroom. Thank you. I'm going to press uh, the three panelists now, uh, starting with Mark and Sandy on their report. Uh, and then a, a different question, though certainly, Robert, you can be, feel free to comment on, on their response. <laughs> the fundamental claim of David Coleman and the Common Core Standards is this, uh, that American students are brought up currently in a narcissistic, uh, how do I feel about me culture, and every text they read is the same text because it's always how do I feel about me. Um, and they come to college and they can't do analytic work. Um, therefore, logically, let's give them far more of the kind of texts that they'll encounter in college, in high school. So it's not a complicated argument. It simply says, let them not come to college and work for the first time with largely non-fictional texts because all the data shows that the vast majority of college students read non-fictional texts far more than they read fiction. Now, you and I in this room may regret that, but that's an empirical fact. Far, far, far more reading in college is non-fiction. So the clear logic is let them read more non-fiction in school. And to Mark's argument that surely literature has its share of complexity, Sure it does, but so does nonfiction. In fact, in the same ACT report that Mark cites, the very next passage, uh, the ACT group gives two examples of work that could be used to prepare for college. One happens to be literary and the other nonfiction. And in the nonfiction passage, every one of those bulleted elements is illustrated. So my question to the two of you is, why are you fighting the obvious? Um, isn't it clear that in order to be better readers of the nonfiction they will encounter in college, students in high school have to do far more reading of complex nonfiction texts? Let me <clears throat> try to answer that and get a, in a few words here. Uh, that the question is, where does that take place? Is that the responsibility and burden of the English teacher because <clears throat> that is one of the critical issues we have to sort out in this very confusing document. Or is it the general burden of all the subjects across the curriculum, as it always has been for 70 to 150 years? Where does college readiness come from? It comes from all the subjects that, at this point, society is deemed should be studied in the curriculum, including science, math, history, and so on. The content of the English class has always been literary study. And what is at stake in Common Core's, we don't have it up here, the title again, but the title is Common Core's English Language Arts Standards with literacy standards for the other subjects. So we're not dealing with the content of the other subjects, we're only dealing with the English class, which has been divided in terms of reading standards 50-50, informational reading and literary reading. Now, let me try to make it clearer by getting to one of the big issues that is pointed out in the new Massachusetts document. Where does a rich academic vocabulary come from? This will get at the question of college readiness. Does an, a rich academic vocabulary come from the science and math courses that kids take? A technical vocabulary comes from those subjects not the general rich academic vocabulary that we think about, and I'll just pluck three words at random from the air, incorrigible, insouciant, uh, inevitable. Where do you see those words? In your math textbook, in your science textbook, or in the reading that you do in literary kinds of works? That's where you're apt to see the general rich vocabulary that students need to acquire which was why the wisdom from 1890 on, and I'm talking about that famous or infamous Committee of 10 back in 1890, 
that said literary study should be the focus of the English class from now on, and they made literature the focus of the high school English class from 1890 on. That was what built up the rich vocabulary of the elite students who were able to take that course of study and go on to college. The question then was, why didn't we make sure that all the rest had it? Well, the schools did try to do that for about 50, 60 years until after World War II. Won't go into the history of the decline in what has been part of the literature curriculum, which would answer your question, but I can't go into the details here. We haven't had that rich curriculum for the middle third of our kids for the past 50 years. They have been, ha they've been given very thin gruel because they were treated as if they were the bottom 30 ready to drop out of school. So we need to think about, contrary to what the architect of Common Core has said, where does rich academic vocabulary come from? It comes from complex literature that they read, not from science and mathematics. That's technical vocabulary. And let's make sure we distinguish the two. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, Robert, do you want to comment quickly before Mark? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm listening to this discussion and realizing that the fundamental fracture line between me and my colleagues is their concern with what children should read. I'm concerned with can children read. Um, and that is a profound difference. And, and what nobody ever points out, I think, about Common Core is that rightly or wrongly, you can think of it as kind of a bottom-up strategy. Uh, it, it's frankly aimed at my students. It's probably not aimed at the students who show up in, in their classrooms. And you can debate whether that's a, a, a wise thing or not. But let, let me make an offer, which is I have a policy idea for you. I will agree to abandon Common Core. You will agree to abandon your criticism. How about this for a report? Instead of the personal essay as the key to the college kingdom, how about we have every college in America stop asking for it? And instead, Will Fitz, you, this will make you happy. Why not have them turn in two pieces of graded work, a research paper? real academic work, that would create a top-down solution to what we're talking about. It would create a market demand for the kind of academic work from the very first days of school, the background knowledge, the writing, the nonfiction, the expository writing that kids need to be successful in college. Somebody please take this idea and make this the law of the land. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, D David's right, of course. Uh, the nonfiction or the, the, the informational text certainly uh, there are dense, sophisticated, intricate uh, works. I mean, you could take Thoreau's Walden as, an, uh, it's certainly nonfiction, uh, and the, it doesn't really have a plot, uh, uh, you know, fictional characters. Uh, you could take Emerson's essays as, uh, as fitting into the informational uh, side of things. The question is uh, whether uh, you are going to read those documents or teach those documents uh, in informational terms or literary terms. And I think there, there's a distinction to be made here. And it comes up with the, we'll go back to the original metaphors of the detective and the journalist. Uh, so many informational texts, those work. Uh, you, you can read Thoreau's Walden and pull out as a journalist references and assertions, uh, empirical statements that, that uh, throw you can gather biographical information uh, about him, about, about Massachusetts in, in the 1830s, 1840s. Uh, and then you can be a detective and look at what this statement means, what this statement alludes to. But that is an inadequate literary understanding of the text. The detective would look at these words and find clues. I and mean, what does the detective do? He, look, he assembles clues and he figures out the case. And it's over. We know what those clues mean at that point and the case ends. Uh, if you're going to take a literary work, something in Thoreau or, or Emily Dickinson, does it work to regard her poems as a detective would? What, you know, if you take a, Further in summer than the birds, pathetic from the grass, a minor nation celebrates its unobtrusive mass. Well, a journalist couldn't do anything with that. <laughs> okay. A detective would try to translate those words into clear set meanings. It would be an extraction of meaning process. This means 
this. What it would mean is pulling out paraphrasable content. That is only a partial understanding of Emily Dickinson's poem because there are ambiguities, complications, there are intricacies, there are shades of meaning and connotation and association that no paraphrasable paragraph would do better than just give a rough approximation of. And that recognition of the gap between that meaning we can pull out as a detective and the text itself is precisely where we develop literary habits of understanding that allow them to reach complex texts, and that would include Supreme Court decisions, and recognizing buried in, you know, there, there's a complication here that a detective approach can't quite accommodate. We, we, we need to have more flexibility, more suggestiveness, more, that, that's what literary reading would do. It would accept certain things that cannot be nicely, neatly determined in, in informational ways. And so that, that's, the, that, that, that's how I would talk about the danger there. Just quickly to say that where the reading of a US Supreme Court decision should take place is in the US government class, not the English class. And there are textbooks that contain court decisions, and they are used in US government classes. This is not the domain of the English teacher who has been trained a particular way with particular coursework to teach certain kinds of things. Scientists are trained a certain way, US government teachers are taught to look at certain materials in political science, and that is the content of their field. So what we've had here is a total muddle about what should be in the English teacher's class that for some reason is seen as where most of the burden for college readiness is to take place, even though there is no necessary, and I'm going to make this a stark statement, even though it is true at the college level that most of what people read, even at the high school level, may be informational reading, that has no necessary logical implication for what the content of the English class should be in the high school. Can I just jump in? You said something, I agree with everything she just said, but she made an interesting observation, which is, is you know, why is it that the, the, the responsibility falls to the English department? Well, that's kind of obvious, because we know that students show up on college campuses and they cannot do two fundamental things, read and write. Other than that, everything's fine. <laughs> and it was the English teacher's fault. Well, but the, and, and this gets to the work that I did. I'm the guy who says, wait a minute, the reason that kids can't read or write has nothing to do with the English teachers. It has to do with the science and the art and the music and the history. And that's all the stuff they need or kids cannot become good readers and writers. So your point is absolutely spot on. We're, we're, we're aiming our bullets in the wrong place, but we can't lose sight of what, what David described as the broad thrust of this which does make a great deal of sense. We have to have train our kids to stop gazing into their, their, their navels. You know, the, the, the joke that I make, the unlived life is not worth examining. But that's the pedagogy so, issue, no. as opposed to the content issue, and we have, again, muddled the two. Speaking as a former commissioner, I can actually tell you why the responsibility was given to uh, the English teachers, and it's none of the above. Um, it's for the simple reason that, as a polity, there was no way we could establish a social studies common core curriculum or standards. Uh, there was, I mean, it's the Civil War in Boston, it's the war between the states in Washington, and it's the war of Northern Aggression in Nashville. Um, so the, 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 the two places we could actually have common core standards politically could only be ELA and mathematics. We can't even agree, by the way, on science. Um, and so it's hard luck to the English teachers, but that's the politics of it. So get over it. Um, they don't admit it. They won't admit it. Let me press now, Robert, on a, a, another side of this multifaceted equation. You cited um, someone who I equally admire, Edie Hirsch, and, and all of the thinking and research that he's done around the, the fact that if students don't have contextual knowledge, uh, they will be bad readers, let alone uh, then poor thinkers. Um, and yet, 
But the Common Core, if you look at New York Engage, which is the New York State Education website, or you look at uh, any number of states where there are now videos of David Coleman um, talking to various commissioners about teaching the Common Core, he says in every single one of them that the key is text, text, and nothing but the text. Mm -hmm. Don't teach the context. Do not do what that wonderful talk we had earlier this morning did, which was to set the context and then give the quotation. On the contrary, the massive mistake in American education has been to contextualize, to teach about the text, to summarize it. There's at least a fundamental tension. Sure. Can you comment on this? Uh, I mean, uh, you know. David were here, I'd love to hear his response to this question because it, as a former teacher, it kind of befuddles me, honestly. All I can su suggest is that he's making an assumption that kids are coming into the classroom with the knowledge they need to successfully grapple with the text. And those of us who've been in the classrooms, especially struggling readers, know that is simply not so. Um, so as much as I'm a defender of Common Core, to suggest that you can focus only on the text, not bring prior knowledge, not bring any of your personal experiences, is simply wrong. It's, it's just not, it's not doable. You can't forget what you know. You, you, it's impossible to extract yourself from the text. But again, I keep coming back to this idea of a market correction. You know, we need to get away from it's all about you to at least, let's at least make an earnest effort to, 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 to recreate what the author is trying to say and to understand what that's all about. Let me now turn a little bit to the teachers who are going to teach um, this common core or some version of it. Given what the panelists know about the basic courses today taught in American universities, um, and speaking now as someone who's in charge of putting about a thousand teachers a year into the New York City schools, what is your sense of the readiness of teachers to teach the Common Core, and um, if they're going to incorporate the kind of literature that you're advocating, and there is a space for introducing more defined literature in the Common Core standards, what are we going to do about getting our teachers ready to teach any defense of the, any model of the Common Core, uh, your preferred model of the Common Core, and today's American teacher? Is there a match? I'll start because I have been talking to English teachers in several states for several years about this. This is the pedagogy issue. There is a content issue and a pedagogical issue. And what Common Core has tried to do, which I frankly support in good part, is the effort to reintroduce close reading again in contradiction to what has been a prevailing model for preparing English teachers in our education schools called reader response. I don't want to get into the weeds, but what it is, and that's where you get the feelings, that's where you get the personalized essays. That was carried to such an extreme, and I also know Louise Rosenblatt, who was considered the author of this approach, except she never went to the extreme that extremists went to in saying that no matter what you see in a text, if that's what you think is there, that's what's there. Doesn't matter what the text actually says, it's what you think the text says, and that's it. There's no possibility for a teacher's judgment, for interpretation based on common understanding of what the author actually intended. So there needed to be this healthy injection of close reading, perhaps not in the way that Cleanth Brooks and Robert Penn Warren intended it to be in the 1930s and 40s, but nevertheless, that was a healthy introduction they didn't talk about what the problem was because they didn't want to alienate, apparently, all the reader response people in the country who are running our English ed departments and, in some cases, many of the English courses at the college level that the teachers major in. So they're getting a different pedagogical model to bring to the classroom. But the content issue is the one that, for the most part, we've been trying to struggle with. You can close read informational material, you can close read literary material. The question is, what should the English teacher be teaching and then applying some of this detective work in a sense to, if you want to call close reading, detective work, which is I think where 
Coleman is getting his uh, metaphor from. So that's the piece of it. The English teachers today, very few of them have had close reading workshops. I know that. The only ones who routinely get it today, from what I've been told, are those who become the AP teachers because the AP workshops only give them close reading training. I've been told this. I cannot verify this. So all the other teachers who come to the schools don't even know what close reading means because they never experienced it as majors or in their English ed training. I'll finish and let you no, I, 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 I can't do anything other than nod my head and, and agree. This is not just a problem in high school mm -hmm. and, and college. It's a problem in elementary schools. Yes. This, is, this is exactly. All the way down. I mean, I mean I, I, talk to me afterwards. I will, I will <laughs> chew your ear off for hours about the just miserable literacy practices that I inflicted upon my kids. Absolutely <laughs> deleterious. Um, you know, and, and that's why I do what I do right now. I, 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 it's, my, it's my penance for, 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 for what I did. Um, but yeah, you know, they, they, she, she's right. <laughs> I was the uh, product of the European and British curriculum where uh, obviously there were a set of set texts, um, there was a progression, there were genres, we memorized vast amounts of, of various authors, um, and I wouldn't, of course, give it up uh, for the world, but uh, there seems to be a collective fantasy here that um, a curriculum of that kind is possible in the United States. Um, isn't it fair to say that whatever his, for whatever his sins, David Coleman and his colleagues went as far as politically possible in defining a set curriculum? a Shakespeare play, some gesture towards 18th and 19th century something, um, a good poem, um, letter from the Birmingham Jail Gettysburg Address, Declaration of Independence, and that's kind of it. Um, not because David Coleman hates great works, but because he knows and his colleagues know that even in Massachusetts, dare I say it, um, when it came to a, a set curriculum. There was no such thing, and there is no such thing. There are a list of 140 recommended texts, um, which are fine. Um, but surely the, the fantasy of the, the real curriculum um, in any sense is politically a non-starter. Mark? Uh, a fact I've encountered time and again. Uh, there is an extraordinary nervousness whenever you bring up something like a reading list. Uh, we didn't do it for AP English literature in, in our reviews a couple of years ago for this. Uh, it happens in other countries. Achieve wouldn't, uh, I was on some committee with Achieve, and Achieve brought in data that they had compiled that high-performing nations elsewhere in the world all laid out a literary patrimony. And this was simply expected. Uh, no one questioned this. Uh, in, in Sandy's book, she talks about uh, how the literary curriculum with, with uh, you know, 190, 80 years ago, this was understood as essential to going to college, uh, knowing this. We had critics, you know, mid, mid 20th century literary critics said, if you do not know the American literary tradition, this is as bad as not knowing the history of the American presidency or the history of American foreign policy, that this form that a fundamental constituent. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's gone, uh, largely. And it may be that this was as far as, as Common Core politically could have gone, but I, I would point to even so Massachusetts has a reading list of 100 and some authors. Uh, why couldn't they have done that pointing to Massachusetts' performance in college readiness and NAEP and say, here, here we have, you care about college readiness. This is the driver for this curriculum. Uh, here you've got an example of a literature-rich curriculum in a state that has done very well on why couldn't you have, why couldn't you cite that as, I mean. Let me point out that this could have been done because it was done here and as someone who was in the Department of Ed and knew what the survey that went out to all the English teachers in the state 
said when it came back, over two thirds were happy with the recommended author list. And when it came time for getting suggestions for revision in 2009, all of 27 people across the state had any suggestion whatsoever for changing a document that they were quite satisfied with. They've been given something totally new. So to say that the architects of Common Core went as far as they could politically is not so. We went much farther than that and got support from a group of English teachers in this state, many of whom, most of whom I would say, are very independent minded, like their autonomy, but they understand where works connect to other works. They understand that in order to appreciate even the title of a Toni Morrison novel, Song of Solomon, you need to have some cultural literacy to know where the words come from so that that part of it was part of their training. They had no objection as long as they weren't mandated to assign Moby Dick to everyone, <laughs> which almost happened. But the point was that as long as you could say recommended authors and you use your judgment in developing a coherent English curriculum, they were satisfied. It could have been done. It wasn't tried for other reasons, and we can't go into that. Um, David Coleman likes to point out uh, when he gives talks on this, um, at least when I'm in the room, that uh, when Common Core came out, I greeted it personally on, on the blog that I write with a piece titled uh, Common Core State Standards, Dead on Arrival. Okay, so I was not always a uh, Common Core devotee, and I remember saying, look, just do what Massachusetts is doing. But the reason I, I opposed it initially was because of that lack of specificity. But frankly, to David's point, we're never gonna have a national curriculum. It's just a political non-starter, I understand that, for reasons of politics, for reasons of culture. But that's why I go back to those 57 words that I showed. Because to me, that's where we're, this battle is being won and lost. We're not sending kids from elementary school to middle school to high school, you know, to heck with what they can read, can they read these texts? Without that, that core, and, and again, this is not even within the English department. If they don't come with that broad cultural knowledge, you know, and, and the formulation I always use is, I'm not trying to impose a canon, I'm trying to curate a body of knowledge. This is the stuff that literate people know and assume you know too. So this is not about uh, coming down from the mountaintop with two stone tablets and saying, these are the works thou shalt read. So this is the stuff people assume you know. Mark has written about this before. Well, uh, just a, a, a genuine question, not sure. a hostile question. Why didn't, in, in that 57 words, why didn't Common Core include English? In, in, in those, I don't know if we can go back to it, you, you, you have science, I can't remember. Why isn't English in that list? Well, I, I think History, social, science, English and other disciplines. Yeah. I mean that as an open question. No, no, I, and, I, and I take the point. And, and now I'm going to do a close reading. Um, <laughs> my, my, my assumption was always that the, the logic there was this is what undergirds literacy. So you don't need to refer to it because this is basically the recipe for it. So at least that was my assumption. The report that Mark and Sandy wrote is deeply worth your reading, and so I, I want to commend it to you. Um, it may get the attention it deserves, I hope it does. Uh, if it does, it will be put under a microscope. Um, one of the key claims there is a claim that uh, one can defend a greater emphasis on literature uh, than the Common Core does uh, for the reasons that Mark laid out, namely that it, it, it teaches this kind of complexity of text, but the major empirical claim is Massachusetts did much more of it and the Massachusetts results are, of course, leading the nation. Um, the obvious rejoinder is that Massachusetts has a tougher barrier of entry for its teachers than any other state in the country and that its success is actually across the board, not just in English, um, and that far more is to be attributable to the quality of its teachers, who, as we know, are the single greatest determinant of in-school learning, than has anything to do with a literary-rich curriculum. I will say that even that is questionable as a statement, because part of what made the four, as far as I'm concerned, the Massachusetts miracle, although 
most reporters aren't interested in what I happen to think <laughs> caused the Massachusetts miracle, is that the department in 2000, 1999 to 2003 was able to take the content of its standards and make sure they were part of teacher training, professional development, teacher licensure tests. In other words, there was a master coordinator who was sort of coordinating all the pieces together. And it was all those pieces together when English teachers wanted to get their license, what was on the test that they had to take for licensure? It was what was in the K-12 standards. So yes, the standards informed the teachers, not only in English, but in all the other subjects as well. That is the whole point that has totally lost with Common Core, because for lack of possibly uh, scope and responsibility, all it is doing is setting forth generic skills, not content standards that can then be inserted into teacher training programs and licensure tests. So it's losing the other parts of this vastly coordinated set of, of a system, in a sense, to accomplish what teachers were then able to accomplish in their classrooms, because that's where it took place, teachers in their classrooms. Um, you know, one thing, we, are there any teachers in the room, by the way? I'm just curious. Good, 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 good. Because good. I, I, this is a, a non sequitur, but I'm kind of curious. How many of you ever refer to the standards documents when sitting down on Sunday night to plan your lessons? Really? Okay, well, that's, that's a few more hands than I thought. Because you don't, yeah, you don't teach standards, you teach curriculum. Uh, so my, my point is, and, and I can't really argue uh, with either Professor Barreline or Professor Stotsky about literature in high school. Um, they are almost certainly right. Uh, but you know, my point is we don't have a standards crisis. We shouldn't even be having a standards battle. We should be having a curriculum crisis, a curriculum battle, because what kids learn matters, and it matters deeply. So, part, and I don't, I don't mean this to be dismissive, but part of the argument in high school, this text, not that text, is almost irrelevant. I mean, you're talking about, at the end of the day, an uptown problem, so to speak. And, and my concern is getting more kids to their classrooms who can do these things. I mean, how many of our students could, could participate in the conversation that we have had today? Not many, not enough. The overarching question is one you've sort of backed us rightly into, which is where our students are coming from. Uh, the inner city student typically in the United States coming into kindergarten has heard some 30 million fewer words spoken to her than her middle class peer, 30 million. Uh, by kindergarten. Um, the Common Core is, above all else, an effort to teach reading. And it is focused on addressing a national crisis, which is that the separation of results is already there in full view by kindergarten and never closes. Um, it may come up a little bit, but the lines remain separated and parallel. Is it not in the end um, politically fraught with risk to have this kind of debate bleed into state politics at a time when anti-federalist instincts are again on the rise? Is the risk that the two of you at least run, Sandy and Mark, that your deeply passionate and well thought out, but ultimately, I'm asking, uh, academic instincts risk derailing what is for all of its problems and warts, and we've certainly had them on full display in the last 45 minutes, a desperately needed corrective to where we are? kind of nostalgic for the Americanizing function of, of, of public schools. Um, and that may be a politically incorrect thing to say, but it's, you know, I'm, I'm the grandchildren of immigrants. That's, that's the, what that, you know, I, I miss the melting pot, as it were. And, and it is, you know, it's become almost impolite to, to, to think of schools um, as Americanizing, but they are. And look, my, you know, my, my immigrant parents in the South Bronx deeply wanted their children to become American. 
So I'm not sure how we lost our way. And to Sandy's point, it's really, it, it is about language, you know, and, 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 um, and, and less uh, about culture. I mean, you, you can't un untwine those things, obviously. Um, but I do think, um, to, to David's question, uh, th this is my fear for those who oppose Common Core. This may be, I don't want to be overly melodramatic about it, our last best hope to get it right. And that's why I come back to those 57 words. You know, for 30 years, Don Hirsch has been saying, it's the content, it's the content. And this is as close as we're going to get to teachers, because you know, I, I started to say this before, standards interest me a little bit less than implementation, to be perfectly uh, honest. It's not about what the standards say, it's about what teachers hear and about what teachers do. So what are the broad messages here? Content matters, coherence matters. Uh, you should be able to tell what you know as opposed to what you think. These kind of broad messages can get us back to where we need to be uh, in the public school system. And look, you know, I understand the criticisms, and frankly, I agree with most of them. It is coercive. It is, you know, uh, the way this is implemented was almost certainly extra legal. But it's still not a bad idea. Uh, well, I, I would just let, lay that out. D David's point is an empirical question, and, and simply look at different curricula and see how different populations do with those different curricula and core knowledge. Uh, curriculum in elementary school, how do those kids do when you look at different demographic groups? How do they do at the next level after having passed through a core knowledge curricula or having passed through this curricula or that curriculum? Uh, I, I, I don't know if there are empirical studies out there to try to determine outcomes, you know, long-term outcomes at the next level. So I, I just I would just shift that back as a as, as a question to to search for evidence. I'm about to invite the audience to ask its questions. I was uh, allowed to make one brief set of remarks myself. I will keep myself to three minutes. Um, I am struck by the way in which arguments in this culture are consequentialist, perhaps because they have to be. Uh, we should teach literature because it is at least as good and arguably much better at teaching future college students how to read non-fictional texts. To me, that's already a tragically, and I mean tragically, desperate and sad argument. Um, Franz Kafka once said that reading a book should be like an ice axe exploding the frozen sea inside your head. The argument for reading great literature is not, in my humble opinion, that it makes you a slightly better reader of your social studies textbook at college. It is because it is one of the great privileges of being human that you can enter onto the raft on the Mississippi that you can be at the Battle of Borodino in War and Peace, uh, that you can stand um, with those whose lives in your head make you a more interesting person to yourself. My argument about what an educated person is is relatively simple and banal. It is someone who isn't a complete bore to themselves. Um, and it seems to me that literature, great literature, is an indispensable part of furnishing the minds uh, of educated human beings. I invite the audience to ask questions. Uh, would you mind going to the microphone? It would be very helpful. Oh. <coughs> I'm David Anderson with Soar Education here in uh, Attleboro, Massachusetts. And my issue has to do with whether the standards are enforced or not. Because what we have in this country is what's usually called social promotion. I call it unwarranted promotion. And children are not academically ready, no matter what the standards are. And so I think that, to me, is an uh, even more important issue than whether we adopt Common Core or whether we adopt, say, the standards consistent with the NAEP or the standards consistent with the ACT, which incidentally is one that I like very much. And I invite your comments. Very simply, you show me the test, I'll show you what's going to happen in the classroom. This is actually one of my greatest fears, and that is, what will be the tests that come out of either or both of the two testing consortia that are now developing test items based on these uh, generic skills 
because there were no real standards there. So what is now happening, and I read whatever I can find available on the website, and for the most part cannot find the information I'm looking for, and that is, where will passages come from? Let's talk just about English language arts. The mathematicians have a whole other set of concerns about mathematics, which I cannot deal with content-wise. But the question is, we don't know where the test items passages, uh, passages are coming from. We don't even know how many types of reading passages there are going to be. But English teachers at the high school level will soon discover when they're piloting them, and then they will make adjustments accordingly because the ax is going to fall on their heads, so far as we know. What that ax will be, we don't know yet because this is yet to play out. But that is going to be the problem. Uh, questions? If you just wouldn't mind standing up and going to the mic so we can work. Now i got to try to get the question out. I'm, a, I'm currently an English teacher. I'm a former director of English education in a small Catholic college up north. Um, I also teach at the graduate level in English education courses, and I'm a doctoral student. Just, I don't know if that gives me any credibility, but I thought, thought I'd tell you that. Um, <laughs> I'm a big fan of E.D. Hirsch, I always have been. Sandra, you know I'm a big fan of yours. Here's my problem. Okay, we have an incoherent curriculum. The English education schools, and again, be, ha having been part of one, are incoherent. All right, and, and they push a lot against a lot of the things that you are all for. I don't think enough administrators are aware of that disconnect. I'm sure some are. And as a researcher, I, I just started my doctoral program, how am I going to come up with the data that Mark pointed out needs to be looked at if no one's doing this stuff in a coherent way at the, in the public schools? A few, you know, the, the core knowledge schools, they're doing it, you know, and, and some charter schools are doing these kinds of things, but we don't have a rich enough area of places to go to, to, to research this. So what, what would you suggest we do to find that data, if that makes any sense? Um, you're not going to get this data, let's be honest. I mean, the, the, the type of long-term longitudinal work that Mark is referring to would take 10, 15 years. I'm making the case that this starts in kindergarten. Well, you want to measure that when these kids are 20 years down the road? We don't have that kind of time to waste. Um, to my, my guiding light on this is less educational research than cognitive science. If you know the work of Dan Willingham, he's been profoundly influential. If you do nothing else, go home and Google uh, the YouTube video that he produced 10 minutes called Teaching Content is Teaching Reading. This is, this is something, what I like about him is that he takes what Hirsch has theorized about for 30 years, and he's the guy in the lab coat who says, yeah, this will work, and here's why. Um, if, we, if we're not going to get uh, the, 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 the research data, at least we can listen to, to, to the scientific experts who can explain the connections between a coherent curriculum and good results down the road. That may be the best we can do. There was another question. Yeah. Gentleman here. Yes. Thank you. All right, thanks for a great program, appreciate it. Um, uh, just a little context, I, I have been a teacher in Boston and now I'm involved in a, uh, as a school board person here um, in Brookline. And my question, um, and, and I've been concerned about uh, the debate regarding uh, these new Common Core standards. And my experience as a teacher was that uh, I discovered only at the end of my first year when I uh, issued a questionnaire to my students uh, asking them why they didn't do their homework. Overwhelmingly, their response was we couldn't read the text. Okay, that was number one experience. And then uh, as uh, a school committee person here in Brookline, my experience has been when I've asked that the Common Core standards are not materially affecting uh, the curriculum uh, in Brookline. So just so people have a context. So now my question is, is there uh, any data uh, on whether or not the clearly valuable classics, uh, study of the classics, is being, is forced, uh, forcing districts to remove those classics from the English curriculum 
uh, or, or, and if it's too early uh, to find that out uh, as we go along, is there any plan to examine that question? Please. I think that's an excellent question for which some empirical data could be gathered, but it would require somebody funding some, some graduate students to go around, speak to different schools, different states, and find out what is now in the English curriculum as of Common Core, as opposed to what was there before. What did they take out and what did they put in? We don't know, we have no idea. It's a very confusing, chaotic situation now. I think David Stanley can talk about New York State because he has a better sense of a whole state's full of English teachers and what they're doing. I know that in Arkansas, they're all redoing their curriculum of what they're taking out, what they're putting in, is anybody's guess. It's a free-for-all. Here, here's my worry that I think echoes the panelists as a whole. Currently, what we've seen is a lot of um, what we unfavorably called bleeding chunks, but are sometimes just called excerpts, um, from great works assembled in large textbooks uh, with a lot of framing language, right? Date, context, and then, you know, a few pages. And it's not clear to me, frankly, that anything will change um, because of the very limits of where we are going with the Common Core, um, hitting the limit of not going towards any kind of prescribed curriculum. And by the way, just to uh, avoid a kind of caricature, the, the rest of the world doesn't say you have to read King Lear. What it says is there is a circulating list of set texts that change through time, um, but that are established for each given grade level at a given time, and then teachers can choose from that very small but changing list. I think there's sometimes a mischaracterization. But I think the worry for policymakers, uh, such as I was and now commenting on, um, is that in the end, will this be a bang or a whimper? And the, Sandy is absolutely right, the tests will tell. If the Park and Common and Smarter Balance, those are the two consortiums, um, have divided the country into two groups, those are the two exam creating consortiums. They each got $180 million from your tax money uh, to, to design the next tests. Um, the tests will define the curriculum. And if there's anywhere that a place like Pioneer and other institutes can put pressure, it's to keep the test makers to using serious texts at least. The problem is, of course, we still can't use set works. And so they'll still be bleeding chunks. Uh, let them at least come from great works. We'll see. Yes, at the back. Um, I don't. I don't actually have any uh, experience, or I'm not a teacher. Right. Um, you know what Oscar Wilde said: "Experience is the name we give to our mistakes." Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wanted to. Um, there's actually a quote from Mark Twain that I think ties in maybe everything we're talking about, where he says, uh, and I don't have the exact wording, and maybe one of the scholars does, but. Something along the lines of like education is like a, a great river, and it and it's long and winds and bends back on itself and has shallows and and uh, a current and slow places and rapids, and eventually it takes you to a big ocean. Um, but what most people do is they just want to dig a trench and go one direction, and that's the way. Um, and then when you read Huckleberry, Finn, I mean he's the kind of guy you said, you know what Huckleberry Finn? Come on, he's kind of the guy. I mean he's the 20th century equivalent of, of our, I mean, he's the guy that would have dropped out of school. Uh, he didn't, you know, he would not have wanted to have had a social commentary on his life or, or be required to take a test or anything. Um, and so, and real briefly, when, when I was uh, a freshman, I, I had to read uh, Beloved and uh, John Steinbeck and all this stuff, and I didn't, I didn't get it. Um, I had no idea what Hamlet was talking about. And I went to a remedial class the next year, and the teacher just said, you know, pick, pick a book. And uh, I picked The Count of Monte Cristo, which uh, probably not literary, probably not on anybody's list, but it's a hell of a page turner. And, and that got me to like to read uh, and to want to read. And then the next year, uh, I was back in a regular class, and the year after that, I was AP. Um, and, and so my question is, 
because Nation at Risk also says um, if you have minimum standards, too often they become maximum standards. And where, you, where, where you're looking to put a, a floor, sometimes you're putting a ceiling. Um, and, and so I, what I want to know is what are your guys' thoughts, especially you, sir? Um, the, the, concern is, the concern is can children read? Um, the great thing about literature to me is that it teaches you to want to read. Um, and, and, and I'm curious to how much trying to quantify it um, diminishes that. If, if I, let me answer the question slightly differently. The sentiment that you just expressed, that you became a reader when you read something that moved you, is at the risk of oversimplifying, what probably that idea is what drives a lot of literacy instruction in, in this country. It's all about engagement. Oh, I don't want to teach kids a canon. I want to create a lifelong love of reading. So therefore, I want them to read books and speak them. I want them to self-select, et cetera. That's how you create readers. That's OK as far as it goes. But, but and again, speaking just from my experience teaching kids in the South Bronx, if all they learn about is the content, the pre-existing content of their own heads, they're never going to encounter Huckleberry Finn. They're not going to take that journey into the ocean that you rather eloquently describe. There's almost an infantilization, and, and, and I want to be very clear about this. I'm not suggesting throw that out, have a canon, but there has to be a sweet middle spot there where you're going to let kids self-select, look, this is what I did when I was in elementary school. We had free reading periods where I discovered you know, books on my own. But there was also a sign reading. It cannot be in either order. We are reaching the end. One last question. Go ahead, sir. Ma'am, ma right there. Yes, ma'am. Oh, good. <laughs> you, you vetoed my other candidate. Oh, okay. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> my name is Thelma Cromwell Moss. And for many of you, whether you are aware or not, in the 70s, during busing, I administered a school called the Experimental School System of Massachusetts. And my boss was Ann Rick, who was the commissioner at one of the innovative things that we did is the very thing you're talking about. Children came to that school, they couldn't read. We taught them through the arts. And they learned. And I had a young man who was the head of the lower school who said, and we were busing children from the um, suburbs into Boston. And of course, they were quite eloquent. And the children in Boston couldn't read, couldn't do other things. And the gentleman who was head of the school said, when they're ready, they'll learn. I disagreed. I said, we will train them. They will read. And of course, it caused a hullabaloo. But needless to say, if we go to where the student is and take him and her from there to where they need to be. And no disrespect on policy and no disrespect on standards. Teachers have to recognize that's why they're there. And so if the student can't read, train him. Put a book in his hand. Give him what it takes. And I guarantee you, when they recognize what the arena is, they move. And, you know, that's all I have to say. I think that will do it. <laughs> I want to thank the panel very much. Folks, um, just, as, just to close up, a couple of uh, closing thoughts for you. One is the air conditioning works really well in this room. Uh, <laughs> so uh, bring your sweaters to the Omni Parker. Uh, second thing is I... Um, I think one takeaway I have from this is we need 58 words, uh, not 57. And uh, putting in English, that would be great. Um, uh, a, a third thing is to say a special thank you to Robert Pendicio. Um, we did have a second panelist to make this an evenly distributed debate. Tag team. Um, but, um, and I do want to let you know, we did talk a lot about David Coleman, get to see you know picture. You know. Um, we, did, we started by inviting him. Uh, and we could not, we went through 10 different folks who were trying to get to yeah, debate and openly. And that says something, we were around the country just contacting folks who we thought really were people of high quality, like Robert, who could uh, present a case that we thought was a really good case. 
Uh, that's what we want to have here. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't get it. So I appreciate the fact that you came out to have that conversation. I, I appreciate the, uh, the tag team references and all that. I like that. It's good. It's good. A um, couple of uh, other things I just want to do uh, note. David's closing statement on the, uh, I'd say, in quotes, utility of literature, I, I really especially appreciate it because I think it also reflects to a great extent of what Tom Birmingham's original goal was with education reform here uh, way back when. And that was that kids not only in affluent communities would have access to great literature, but everybody, including the then Senate President's Chelsea, would get it as well. Uh, that's what this is about. And I think I'd make one comment where we had this conversation about uptown versus downtown. Uh, I would say the empirical evidence around Massachusetts is that aiming uptown for everybody is good for everybody. And that the improvement for Hispanics, for African Americans, and everybody, all subgroups <coughs> in Massachusetts has been stellar. Uh, in terms of Hispanic growth, we never consider ourselves to be a, a, a wonderful performer in terms of turning around Hispanic education, the education of our Hispanic uh, students here. We never say that. Uh, Jeb Bush will go out and say that Florida's doing a great job. We're about two points behind him over a 12-year trajectory. That's how powerful the Massachusetts reform has been. Things we don't even brag about were in the top tier in terms of improvement, not just where we are, but improvement. So I think aiming uptown for everybody, that's what I'm for. Uh, so uh, I would say one final thing is, and this is on, I think, something that Mark was saying. Um, the, an empirical basis is in crucially important. I think your name is Mark as well, is that correct? What was your name? Bill. What's that? Bill. Bill, thank you for your question. I think the, the idea of having an empirical basis for any policy change is crucially important. And if this is, if Common Core is the last best hope, when it's never been tested out, there's no empirical basis for it, I would be much more confident if we had the empirical basis for Massachusetts supporting this being applied to different states in a staged effort, understanding that some other states could not get there quickly. Not to say Massachusetts is the end all be all. It is certainly not. We have huge gaps, as we know, as we can stare in the face of Lawrence every day. So not trying to say we're the end all be all. But those are some takeaways I think that were, are probably important before we head off for a book signing. Um, there are lots of books back there. And as you're lining up, I would just note a couple of things. On October 9th, we have an event on Sabbath International, which is a, a fantastic charter operator. Has Two fantastic schools, one in Springfield, one in Holyoke. Uh, they are now opening in Lowell. They have two charter applications uh, for this year's cycle as part of 22 charter applications, the largest number ever in Massachusetts history. We're very, very pleased with that. But we're doing an event on their school system, how they do what they do, how they get the results they get. Second thing, and that was again October 9th. Uh, the second one is in a more immediate time frame, that is September 24th. We have our annual Better Government Competition Awards Dinner. It's a great event. Um, and we have Michael Barone, who's a political commentator, was a former editor at US News World Report, as well as the Washington Post previously, uh, talking. It's all about the question of federalism and how we actually restore a sense of responsible federalism, not an ideological one where we say, oh, the federal government's bad, the states are good, let's bring all those federal governments back to the states, they'll do a great job of it. It's not true. Uh, but it's trying to figure out how we have this conversation about our federal state relations so we can actually deliver better services at a, frankly, more affordable cost to everybody. Thank you very much for being here.